Soldiers of the 18th and 19th centuries would carry a wide variety of weapons and tools to practice their deadly battlefield art. Muskets, pistols, flags, swords, pikes and halberts, and of course, cannon. Wait, 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 wait. One of those things is not quite like the others. If you're going to be in a battle, then what possible use is a flag going to be to you? Surely it wouldn't be anywhere near as useful as a gun, and if anything, it might just make the person carrying it a much bigger target, right? And all for what? So that the army can look a little prettier while it stands in its great big long lines? Well, no. There was a reason why armies used to carry flags into battle. A lot of reasons, in fact. Some of them may be a little surprising to you. Uh, in fact, a far cry from being useless, flags were one of the most important parts of any fighting force, and they would be defended with the same zealotry as any general or any cannon would. Uh, arguably, in fact, even more so. So in this video, I'd like to explain why that was. What made these flags so important? But first, of course, a word on behalf of the video's sponsor, World of Warships. This video has been sponsored by World of Warships, the greatest free-to-play naval warfare game out there today. Featuring over 600 different ships from 10 different nations, you can dominate over 40 unique maps in mighty battleships. You can rule the skies from your flat-top aircraft carriers, or even be sneaky-beaky under the waves with a submarine. These beautiful models, based off the real blueprints of course, set sail over stunning new water effects that look practically like the real thing, while dynamic weather patterns will batter away at you. Just don't get too distracted by how beautiful it all looks, because remember, you're in a 12v12 battle out there with a very active gaming community. Not only are you able to play the game on PC, but also on Xbox, PlayStation, and even mobile now as well. The game is releasing new content every month, from new ships and nations to cosmetics and even entirely new ship classes. Sometimes they're historical, which I definitely prefer as you might expect, and other times they're a little bit more, well, silly, like Godzilla or Transformers themes. But whatever style you happen to prefer, there's always something new to be had in the game. And after you download the game today using that first link in the description down below, when you use the code Happy New Year 2024, not only will you get seven days of premium account time, but you'll also get one free ship, a million credits, 300 doubloons, three Santa's gift containers, and the New Year constellation flag alongside 10 New Year sky camouflages. I really like this sponsor because, well, don't tell the others, but I actually enjoy this game, I actually play it, so go check it out and thank you to World of Warships for sponsoring this video. So what's going on with all these flags? Well, the very first thing to cover is that they weren't referred to as flags. In the British Army, they were called the Colours, and every regiment had two sets of them. The Regimental Colours, and the King's or Queen's Colours. For the former, their face would vary in colour and design from regiment to regiment, and in the days when regimental coats each had a different coloured facing on them, uh, mainly in the 18th century, the colours of the regimental colours would often match uh, those of the facings. And for the latter, the sovereign's colours, they're generally going to be the national flag with some additional adornments, again varying from regiment to regiment. A, a popular exception to that rule, though, would be the guards' regiments, uh, who like to insist on being an exception to almost all the rules. Uh, now, these adornments might include things like the, uh, the regiment's battle honours, which are basically just a list of all the engagements in which the regiment had fought particularly well and honourably, uh, usually, as you may imagine, to victory. Uh, the older and more storied the regiment, the greater that list of honours might grow, and some sets of colours have to be pretty uh, creative with how they fit all of those names of battlefield and such in on them. Uh, now, much like the infantry, the cavalry also uses a system of colours, uh, but they call them guidons, uh, and some regiments of artillery, like the King's Troop Royal Horse Artillery, for example, actually have one of their guns serving as their standard, rather than a flag or any other sort of symbol, uh, which is why you'll always see uh, that gun in particular saluted in the same way that you would one of the flags. 
And of course, this isn't all limited to the British Army, that's just what I'm going to focus on for this video, because most of the information is the same, or similar in other settings, and that's just what I'm most used to. Most organized armies back in the day would use colors, or variants thereof, up until pretty much the later days of the 19th century. The Ottoman Empire had crescents, which doubled actually as musical instruments. And according to the book, Their Infantry and Guns Will Astonish You, the Mughal Empire had standards of metal statuary, ranging from an upraised hand, a dragon's head, a golden ball, and a jewel-encrusted fish, even, alongside a variety of different flags that they would use. And during the Napoleonic era, the French imperial eagle was a symbol of particular pride, hearkening back to the days of ancient Rome, which also used golden eagles as their standard, or at least as a part of their standards, uh, where, in the days of swords and shields, they served practically the exact same purpose on the battlefield of Kaisar as they did of Napoleon. But what were those purposes? Could something so decorative really have a practical function on a battlefield? And then even then, wouldn't it have been better to give the soldiers carrying them, you know, guns instead? Whatever the practical purpose is, surely shooting the enemy is more practical, right? Well, the answers to all those questions and more lie in the means by which warfare was fought throughout most of history, and especially the time period we're talking about now, being mainly the 18th and 19th centuries. Uh, which is to say, warfare isn't mostly being waged in small, more open groups, like the platoon-level, you know, uh, firing squads we have nowadays and such, but they're being fought in large, dense formations, in lines, shoulder to shoulder, in columns, and in squares. Now, I won't get into why that was here, but if you are interested, well, I have an entire video series describing why soldiers were still fighting that way, with lines and the like, uh, in the era of muskets and cannon. Suffice to say, it wasn't because warfare was somehow more polite back in the day, but it owed to things like the presence of heavy cavalry on battlefields, and the needs of maneuvering large bodies of men. And there rests the number one practical reason for these armies to be using standards of some sort or another uh, in, in the 18th century, and again the 19th and blah blah blah. Unit cohesion. Battles are massive, unwieldy, impossibly complex, chaotic, and beastly things. Hell on Earth is the usual descriptor. It's already difficult enough to get thousands and thousands of people to all move in tandem with one another, and it's quite more so when there's cannonballs cutting great big holes in the groups, and the air is filled with smoke and musket balls. Coordination during combat is a very difficult thing, and it's also one of the most important elements of combat. In order to help soldiers stay with their units, and commanders to know what's happening where on the battlefield, armies had all sorts of tools. Sometimes officers and NCOs would carry things like pikes and halberts so they could be spotted at a distance. Drummers and buglers and the like would help to convey orders across long distances. And the regiment's colors, massive and, well, colorful as they were, would stand out against the backdrop. When the regiment was marching, even if they couldn't hear the commands, soldiers could see the colors advancing and know to follow them. If you do not know your duty, simply follow the colors and you shall find it. During a bayonet charge, the men could dress on the colors, making sure that their formation was in an orderly line so they're not going to be reaching the enemy uh, piecemeal, but rather as a single solid block of steel. If a soldier happened to become lost on the battlefield, or worse yet, if the unit entirely broke and routed, well then the colors are the central point upon which they could all rally and reform back together. These standards would also allow for units to be identified quickly and effectively, both for messengers who have to locate different officers very quickly in order to convey orders, and for the generals themselves gazing with telescopes across battlefields that could be miles long. You may not be able to make out you know, where the officer is in that unit, you may not be able to make out the colors of their uniforms, but you will make out the great big flags flying over top of them. The colors, to put it simply, were one of the army's most important communications devices, and that's one of the reasons why it was so important that they be protected at any and all costs. 
in the British infantry in particular, the honor of carrying the colors would fall to ensigns. Edward Augustus Kendall's Pocket Encyclopedia of 1811 provides a definition of ensign as the officer that carries the colors, being the lowest commissioned officer in a company of foot, subordinate to the captain and lieutenant. It is a very honorable post. An ensign is to carry the colors in assault, battle, etc., and should not quit them, but with his life. Now, not every ensign is going to be carrying one of the colors. Uh, every regiment had a lot more ensigns than they had flags, uh, but different regiments would have their own methods to decide uh, which ensign would receive the honor of doing so. Uh, typically in the British Army of the 18th century, ensigns didn't really have a lot of very formal responsibilities or opportunities to prove themselves. They were more just like, well, they were junior officers in the most literal sense. They're basically learning how to be officers on the job. It's only when they get to the point of being a lieutenant that they really start seeing more responsibility. Uh, and so in that situation, if you're looking for stuff to do, looking for jobs to do and everything, well, for a young aspiring officer, carrying the colors was a chance to prove themselves worthy for advancement. It was also one of the most dangerous jobs on offer for them. One of the most iconic accounts of that danger comes from the Battle of Albuera, fought in 1811 as part of the Napoleonic Wars. Here I'll read the story as recounted in The Soldiers Whom Wellington Led, published in 1913. Now, this account is definitely very much of its time, but taking the precise details with a good amount of salt, it still gets the overall point across, I think. Uh, and if you'd like to read this whole book yourself, it'll be listed as a free PDF on my website, nativeoak.org. But in any case, we have the story of the colors of the Royal East Kent Regiment, the Buffs, at the Battle of Albuera. Within the first minute, the command of one of the companies, the captain being wounded and taken prisoner, devolved upon Ensign Edward Thomas, a boy ensign only 15 years of age. The trampling horsemen were surging round him, but fearless and quite calm, the boy only thought of his men. Rally on me, men, the brave lad shouted to those of his broken-up company nearest him. Ensign Thomas was carrying the regimental color, and he stood there holding it on high for the soldiers to form round. They had, though, little chance of doing that, and the next instant a swarm of savage poles were round the lad and upon him. One of their officers called to the boy ensign to give up his flag. Never, never accept with my life, came back the defiant British answer. The lancers dashed in instantly, and the splendid young hero was stabbed to death on the spot. The color was captured, but was recovered later on. The king's color of the buffs were carried that morning by Ensign Walsh, an Irish lad from King's County, just 16 years of age. The men of the color party, whose duty it had been to protect the flag, had fallen in its defense, and the ensign, running to where half a dozen of the buffs were fighting with their bayonets back to back in a rallying group, was made at and chased by eight or ten Polish lancers and hussars, who darted furiously after him to seize his flag. Ensign Walsh was surrounded and wounded and knocked down, still clinging to his flag. Before he could be made a prisoner, or the color be wrested from his hands, another officer of the buffs rushed through and got to him. He was Lieutenant Matthew Latham. Latham seized the color pole from the nearly stunned boy Ensign's hands, and with his sword tried desperately to keep the ring of enemies off. Surrounded by the swarm of frenzied assailants, slashing or thrusting at him in their eagerness to carry off the trophy, Lieutenant Latham, in spite of them all, clung with despairing tenacity to his precious charge. He was shouted at to drop the flag and yield, but he refused. I will give it up only with my life, he called back in the faces of his crowding enemies. He was covered with wounds already, but stubbornly defending himself with his sword, the magnificent fellow did his utmost to keep them all at bay. The honor of his regiment was in his hands. Matthew Latham was not going to surrender his colors to any enemy. A French hussar seized the staff of the color. Standing up in his stirrups, he aimed a fierce cut at the head of the brave lieutenant. The blow failed to strike Latham down, but it mutilated him cruelly, shearing away one side of his face and nose. 
even then, although a mass of blood from his injuries as he was, and reeling well-nigh stunned by the hussar's blow, Latham's dauntless resolution did not weaken. Recovering himself with desperate and amazing vigor, he still fought on. A mob of assailants was swarming about him, grabbing at the flag, jostling round as they furiously strove to tear the color from his hands. Lieutenant Latham kept them off until a second saber slash cut his left arm and the hand in which he held the color clean off. But still, the British lieutenant's indomitable spirit was not conquered. Maimed and horribly mutilated as he was, he let go of his sword and seizing the color staff with his right hand, made his last effort to hold on to the flag. That was all he could do. A moment after, he was thrown over to the ground and trampled on by horse hoofs and pierced with innumerable lance thrusts. But the very number of his enemies impeded their efforts to destroy him. Before they could make an end of the brave fellow, just as they were about to finish Latham off, half a dozen British dragoons came plunging through to the place, and the French troopers, foiled and baffled at the last moment, turned off in haste to gallop away elsewhere. Lieutenant Latham was still alive. He was just conscious, and in that extreme moment, he thought only of his flag. Exerting what little strength remained to him, he managed to rip away the silk of the color from the staff and to drag it underneath his body. Then he became unconscious from the loss of blood. Like I said, the account is definitely uh, of its time, but regardless of the embellishments here and there, there is still truth to the account. Uh, now, Latham survived, by the way, and became a bit of a hero to his regiment. There's all sorts of artwork out there showcasing his uh, glorious last stand. Uh, to defend the regiment's colors was a very dangerous task. And while they were typically carried, yes, by ensigns, they would be defended by pretty significant groups of men collectively called the Color Reserve, or in later years, the Color Guard. It would typically consist of senior NCOs and officers, and they would often form up at any given unit's center, um, but really, depending on the circumstances, they could be placed wherever was most uh, practicable at the time. But above all else, the color guard is intended to protect the colors, not necessarily to be getting into action themselves. So during a bayonet charge, for example, you could expect to see the colors flying right alongside the rest of the troops. Absolutely, they're at the front. But if it actually came to a melee, which is actually pretty rare, all things considered, it's not like the ensigns are you know, gonna be out there with the flag in one hand and a sword in the other. If they can help it, they're going to be more at the rear to serve, again, as that identifying marker, that rallying point, that communication tool that you can use to signal, all right, everyone, we're going back, we're going forward, we're, you know, doing different things. My microphone just fell down, so I'm going to pick that up, put it back there, and carry on with the one take because I thought I was doing pretty good there. Still, without actively seeking to get into the fray themselves, you know, they're not looking for combat, all the same, the colors are a massive target for the enemy. And so, while it may have represented, yes, and again, a great opportunity for advancement to some, well, certain others may not have been so keen to uh, be tasked with defending the target of so much enemy attention. For example, uh, we have the account of Sergeant William Lawrence, who was present at the Battle of Waterloo. Uh, and again, if you'd like to read his full account, you'll find it at nativeoak.org. Uh, but he would write of his experience. About four o'clock, I was ordered to the colors. This, although I was used to warfare as much as any, was a job I did not at all like. But still, I went as boldly to work as I could. There had been before me that day 14 sergeants already killed and wounded while in charge of those colors, with officers in proportion, and the staff and colors were almost cut to pieces. This job will never be blotted from my memory, although I am now an old man. I remember it as if it had been yesterday. There had not been more than a quarter of an hour when a cannon shot came and took the captain's head clean off. This was, again, close to me, for my left side was touching the poor captain's right and I was spattered all over with his blood. It's important to point out that the colors wouldn't always be deployed because they weren't always necessary. If a regiment or a battalion is fighting in a much more dispersed manner rather than as a large single block, 
Well then, the need to have that central rallying point wasn't really as strong. You're not keeping cohesion across a very large frontage. Uh, you don't have to have everyone be able to see a central point on which they're taking their dressing and whatnot. Um, and in those sorts of situations, the colors might be left behind in order to lessen the risk to them. You know, you're not putting them unnecessarily into harm's way, or you're not having them sort of left on their own while different companies are going around and all doing their own things. Uh, for example, during the American War of Independence, uh, it wasn't really all that common to have that, again, traditional order of battle like you'd see over in Europe. And much of the commanding was being done, yes, at the company, or as it was termed, the subdivisional level, rather than at the battalion level. Uh, and as a result of that, the British Army would, yes, usually leave their colors behind with their garrisons, uh, along with the heavy baggage and whatnot, things like their tenting and whatnot. Um, with, yes, uh, of course, certain exceptions. Uh, for example, the British would use their colors at the Battle of Camden, uh, Battle of Cowpens, uh, other, you know, other, you know, select examples. Um, but, uh, for example, their German allies, on the other hand, uh, they would sometimes insist on bringing their colors even when it was impracticable. And speaking to that practice, Major General uh, Baron Friedrich von Losberg would comment, The country is bad for fighting. Nothing worries me more than the colors, for the regiments cannot stay together in an attack because of the many walls, swamps, and stone cliffs. The English cannot lose their colors, for they do not carry them with them. And if you'd like to read more about all of that, well, the info is pulled from a fantastic book, With Zeal and With Bayonets Only, by Matthew Spring. But, then, why was that even a debate? If the colors were ever impracticable for their actual function on the battlefield, well, then, why would anyone, even Germans, consider ever bringing them along? And for that matter, why were these singular tools defended so vigorously by the soldiers to the point that they would put themselves in harm's way and sacrifice themselves for it? In pretty brutal fashion, too, according to, you know, one of those accounts we read. I mean, yeah, sure, the flags and such, they may be important tools for the men to rally around and to keep their dressing, but it isn't like those things are totally impossible without them. They just help with that process. We don't read oftentimes accounts of men, you know, guarding their muskets or a drum or a bugle with such ferocity. So, so why all the bother? Well, because the colors were, and indeed they are, so much more than just a set of flags. Now, I know that in this video I've mainly been using the past tense, talking about battlefield use mostly in the 18th century. But armies all around the world still use colors and variants on the theme today. In fact, the British Army only stopped using them in combat in like the 1880s at the First Boer War. The colors represent the regiment. They represent its memory and reputation, its heart and its soul. They are the physical embodiment of the soldier's fallen comrades. It has within the militaries who follow such traditions, practically a religious significance. To lose the regiment's colors would be to lose the very soul of the regiment itself. It is a disastrous thing. On his presenting new colors to the Durham Light Infantry in 1911, King George V would tell his soldiers, Remember that this is no common flag which I am committing to your keeping. It is the emblem of duty, the outward sign of your allegiance to God, your sovereign and country, to be looked up to, to be venerated, and to be passed down untarnished by succeeding generations. And this religiosity is not constrained to history either. In the British tradition, when a regiment's colors are due to be replaced, they are laid up typically in a church, a chapel, or a cathedral of some sort, within the regiment's traditional recruiting grounds, where they hang above the monuments and memorials to the glorious dead, standing as if worshipped alongside the more traditional figures of divinity. Once laid up, the colors will hang largely undisturbed until practically disintegrated, at which point the remains will be taken down and ceremoniously burnt by the regiment. One such event took place earlier this year, as reported in the Salisbury Journal. 
On Tuesday, March 7th, a ceremony was held after Evensong in Salisbury Cathedral, at which the remains of the colors of the 62nd Regiment of Foot, the Wiltshire Regiment, was taken down after hanging in the cathedral for more than 175 years. The colors will be cremated before being interned to in the garden of the Rifles, Wiltshire and Berkshire Museum in the cathedral close in May. The colors embody the honor, spirit, and heritage of the regiments that proudly carry them. In this case, the colors were carried in Sicily and Italy in 1806-1814, to 1814, lost for seven months in the Ganges in 1842, when the boat carrying them from Calcutta to Dingapore capsized, and were eventually laid up in Salisbury Cathedral in 1848. Places like the Guards Chapel in London particularly feature colors of their regiments going back well into even the 18th century. And whenever new colors are presented to a regiment, it's always done with incredible amounts of reverence alongside the usual pomp and ceremony. It's a big deal, and not just because it's quaint or old or anything. These symbols retain their meaning for the military even today. So why did some soldiers carry flags instead of guns in a gunfight? Well, there are a lot of reasons. Some of them are fairly immediate in their concerns, while others are more ethereal, but no less important. If anything, in fact, it's those less tangible elements of things like regimental colors and imperial eagles and whatnot that made them so important. They have value because value is ascribed to them, both historically and today, whether on the field of battle or off of it. The value thus provided to these soldiers, past and present, by the colors is much greater than any single extra firearm ever could be. They were tools for coordination and rallying, of communication and identification on smoky, linear battlefields. And they were and are, they have always been, sources of inspiration, of hope, of glory, as well as of reverential remembrance. Now, thank you all for watching. I hope that you've enjoyed this video and uh, that you've learned something new from it. Uh, if you have, then you would be so kind, of course. Uh, it's always a great help to this channel uh, to like the video and offer your thoughts in a comment. It helps the almighty algorithm and all that. Uh, likewise, if you're not already subscribed but are interested in seeing more videos like this one, uh, well, you know what to do. Uh, as always, a great deal of gratitude is uh, owed to those most noble persons who support my work on Patreon because their support is exactly the thing that allows me to carry on with this work. Thank you all, and until the next time, my dear viewer, I am and I shall remain your most humble and obedient of servants.